Okay, so Wells says small phase two randomized studies don't get you onto NCCN. Let's talk about BRAF and Scott Kopetz's small phase two <laughs> randomized study looking at uh, the addition of vemurafenib. Uh, in BRAF uh, mutated metastatic colon with a knife PFS, a trend towards OS. Is it statistically OS or just trend? OS. Okay. It was a trend. Um, and and um, so, but that's in. So when you get a BRAF patient, Marlon, mm -hmm. what, are you, what are you doing with that patient? Metastatic. So, I mean, if I know uh, that they are BRAF mutated, they're good performance status younger, first line, I think we would consider those patients for full FOXI rebev in the first line setting. And again, it's not a robust data set, but there's subgroup analyses uh, from the TRIBE trial as well as other phase two data that show that the response rate is, is better with full FOX theory in that setting. They're often uh, right-sided. They're often right-sided. About a third of the right-side tumors, or 25 to 30%, are going to be BRAF mutated. And they're going to be RAS wild type, right? They're going to be RAS so wild the type. the temptation here is to give an EGFR therapy. An MSI? And it, it, well, sometimes they're MSI. Correct. Correct. But it's critical to check that, that yeah. I think is yeah. one key yeah. point here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, I, and, uh, and ideally pathway. that panel is done all up front, yeah. as we discussed yeah. earlier, so that you know what you're dealing with. Uh, and, and, and you raise a good question, is, is there a role for anti-EGFR therapy in those patients alone uh, without any BRAF inhibitor being added? And, and I think there's no convincing data that, that anti-EGFR would work. I mean, we, we've seen data in that setting even about 10 years ago in series of patients with BRAF mutated with single agent anti-HFR therapy with no responses. Now there are some retrospective analyses of prospective studies that suggest a slight improvement in response rate maybe with anti-HFR therapy, but I don't think there's a convincing signal that we put a dent in PFS and OS. Uh, of course, uh, Scott's study is different. Uh, that's targeting EGFR and BRAF at the same time, and, and I think uh, even though that study is a phase two, even though it's randomized, this is a unique patient set that has no good options. And I think it is fair to consider those patients if there's no clinical trial to enroll them on in the second line setting to consider uh, vemurafenib, cetuximab, or remotecan. The second line study is the Beacon trial, right? And it's uh, trying to take Scott's idea and go one further with additional with the control arm having cetuximab as one of the options. Anybody participating in, in that study? Yeah, yep, yes. we've, yep. we've got it yep. open. These yep. patients are hard to find. They I do think we find. have to uh, you know, curb our enthusiasm in terms of expecting large phase three trials with mm. these subsets. Mm. Uh, I do want to uh, point out though that, because I, I do sometimes see patients who have a BRAF status but they haven't checked MSI. And there's an overlap. You, first of all, you cannot inherit a BRAF mutation. There are no BRAF mutated families. It's embryonic lethal. So that's one point. The second point is because of a methylation phenomenon, many patients who are BRAF mutated will be MSI high, which might drive uh, treatment. So I think it's really important. And anytime I'm looking at a BRAF data set and it doesn't tell me the MSI status, because both of those are such important prognostic factors, it's kind of hard to interpret sometimes. So, Gabriella, let me ask you about liquid biopsies in colorectal cancer. There's one of the abstracts here looking at circulating her B, um, measuring her two. For me, I'm still, you know, the data was with traditional measurements of IHC, fish, and fish, not these genetic abnormalities. And so, but a lot of us are doing these profiles and we're not getting the IHC data. And now we've got a circulating factor. Is, is, is liquid biopsy entered the world of colorectal cancer, do you think? I don't think um, it's really at the universal level yet. Uh, I don't think it's as high on our plates as, for example, for our lung cancer colleagues mm -hmm. who are testing EGFR mutations uh, routinely with GARDEN 360. Having said that, um, I just cannot tell you just in the last few weeks how many uh, biopsies I've sent to foundation upfront for colorectal cancer patients that all came back as not enough uh, tissue and tumor nuclei for analysis. And I think for these patients that have uninterpretable biopsies, uh, I think we should be looking at uh, liquid biopsies and try to interrogate as much as we can um, their DNA, their yeah. tumor DNA. It's an interesting evolution. You guys, Bert? Not, not doing it much, at least up front. You know, we do it as part of a broader panel when we're looking for treatment options for someone that's running out. It is interesting, though, because I think one of the more recent, well, the more interesting recent stories is the, is the HER2 story. You know, one, the HER2 positive tumors may add to the group that doesn't really respond well to EGFR antibodies, and two, they, may, they have their 
own potential separate therapy. So and they're often left-sided, so the majority of them are going to be left-sided, and that's that patient you'd like to give. Like to EGFR give the EGFR to. So, uh, you know, and, and, and if you do your next gen, you're not picking up her too. So, I mean, it maybe argues that we need to start looking at IHC early. You know, it, it, I think it's for no something like the we got tissue with you know it's not like we're dealing with lung cancer or right, you know, right. pank we got plenty of tissue around and you can get more. <laughs> <laughs> get more. I mean, there, there is a national trial. Hopefully, everyone's participating in that. It's a SWOG study looking at a HER2 directed therapy for HER2 uh, uh, altered uh, colorectal cancer patients. And you know, if you test in RAS and RAF wild type, it really does enrich the uh, patient mm -hmm. population and resistant patients as well. I mean, if somebody, a key message is that if you have somebody who's RAS wild type, you haven't checked her too, and you've seen them progress within four months of anti HFR therapy, left-sided, there's a very good chance, maybe up to 10, 15 percent, that that patient may be actually HER2 amplified. But I have to say, if you're doing an NGS panel that includes amplifications, you get that data, yeah. right? So, so depending on what NGS panel you're ordering, if you're getting foundation, you're going to get your HER2 amplification. I mean, to me, the, the HER2 testing uh, or, or the scoring of HER2 by, by liquid biopsy is, is interesting, but I'm not sure that it sets any go, no go standard because you, you know, we know from the Heraclius trial that if you have more than nine copies by, by fish, you have a much better response. So, so we need to figure out what is our best test to kind of stratify patients. Yeah, I mean, we tend to use uh, a, a a Keras's uh, profile mainly because it has the IHC component in there, and um, and but you know that's a wild west as well as how molecular testing is done. So I would just I think we all would agree to a cautionary note on on uh, circulating uh, biopsies, liquid biopsies, at least in the GI cancer space.